But I will say, I think one of the biggest surprises for me was the fact that, especially in higher education, people want to know who you are. Mm. And I have to tell you, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer by training. I build by the hour. I have to confess, build by the minute. And when you're <laughs> doing that, nobody wants to know who you are. Um, you know, they want to know what you can do for them, uh, but they really are not interested in spending their money to find out who you are. This is the Leadership Foundry Podcast. I'm your host this week, Brandon Smith. Our guest this week is President Lee Zak of Agnes Scott College. I loved my conversation with President Zak today. We talked about everything from innovation in higher education, which is a challenge, to relationship building, which is so critical in complex environments like that where you have shared governance. I loved our conversation, and I think for all of us as leaders, we can learn two critical things the importance of relationship building and how we can do that more effectively when everything is running so fast? And how do you make innovation a cultural way of living, not just a process or a one-off? President Zach handled those questions so masterfully. I know you're gonna enjoy the conversation. And of course, stay tuned to the very end and I'll share my highlights. Lee, so excited to have you on the show here today. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm really thrilled about uh, not only your experiences broadly and your journey, but specifically some of the recent things you've been doing at Agnes Scott. So before we kind of jump into that great work you've been doing, uh, maybe a good starting place, tell us a little bit about your journey. What, what's been your kind of career and leadership journey up to this point? Thank you very much. It, it's a bit of a journey and an unusual journey, especially for a college president. I started out as a practicing lawyer. I came to that from going to Northeastern University Law School. And the reason that that's relevant is Northeastern was a pioneer. It was a pioneer in education, mm -hmm. focusing on co-op education. So as an attorney I, and as a law student, I went to school for a quarter, work for a quarter, school for a quarter, work for a quarter. That's really interesting. You don't hear about that that often. It's very unusual. Northeastern's one of the few law schools that has that. Yeah, I, I, you don't hear that often in law schools, and, hardly at all. And what it did is, one, it gave an opportunity to experience different things, two, get you accustomed to change, and three, make you realize with an education, you can do many different things. And that's something I learned at Mount Holyoke, a woman's college, focusing on critical thinking and writing, but it was really brought home um, at Northeastern. So I say I really am who I am because of my education. Wow. So after that fantastic education, I went on to practice in a large law firm in Boston. It's an international law firm today. And I focused on this area that was a little bit unusual. It focused on financings for colleges and universities. Interesting. Toll roads and airports, how to build things yeah. and how to finance them. But I've always had wow. this thing about how do you relate one thing to the other? How do you create? I always want to do something a little bit different. Mm. So one of the things I realized is that the same techniques that were being used for toll roads in the United States and financings um, with respect to airports are being used internationally. And you know, international economic development was something I always loved. So I convinced one of my clients, a major bank in Boston, that we should take this technique and together go forth and apply it to do international projects. So as a result, I developed the international practice at my law firm, and we were doing projects around the world. Um, everything from power plants in the Philippines to McDonald's bun factories in Brazil, wow. um, to telecom in Poland. Um, so I recognized that I love to take something, find the thread, and figure out how you do it somewhere else um, in a different way. Along the way, um, I you know, went, went and did what partners do in law firms and tried to develop clients. And I was talking to a major government agency and the general counsel, and I had lunch with him. And I went back again, and we met again. And um, finally, he said to me, you know, I'm not going to hire outside counsel, but how would you like to be general counsel? Oh, interesting. And I said, ooh, this is really interesting. Um, I've done, I've been the partner, I've done the th that thing before. 
this could be really interesting. So that's how I ended up being a general counsel in a U.S. government agency and under something that's called Career um, SES, Senior Executive Service. And when I was there, I had uh, the head of the agency asked me, would you, how would you like to be the chief operating officer of the agency? And I'm like, okay, I like to run things. Um, I can do this. I have the finance background. I have the legal background. I think I have the people skills. Um, let's let me let me do this. And then um, in government agencies, when there's a, tra a transition from one administration to the other, the most senior person, career person, is the one who runs the agency. So I was running the agency um, during that time as the acting head of the agency. Wow. And I have to confess, I was a little too dumb to know that you aren't supposed to do anything. I thought this was, you know, everyone in government like just stops. And I'm like, no, this is it. This is our time. Like, everybody, what did you ever want to do? Let's do it and put it in place before anybody new comes in. And, you know, we know what the basic principles are of the administration. So let's give it a try. So I kept moving forward. I kept talking to other agencies, and I kept saying, so what are your priorities? And we're like, we don't know. We don't have a new head yet. Um, and we kept moving forward. And in government, a transition team comes in, an outside team, and they look at what's happening in the agency. And they came back with something very unusual. And they said, we like what's going on in this agency. And we, instead of going through the usual who are the high donors, et cetera, um, we'd like to take this person who was a career senior executive service and ask her to be a presidential appointee that would be Senate confirmed and run the agency. Wow. And so it was a great honor. Um, and I have to say, it was also because of some incredibly idealistic, very young people and presidential personnel that that all happened. So were you surprised when that happened? I was very surprised. I mean, people had been coming up to me at social gatherings, at events, you know, at the agency, telling me that they were going to be the new head of the agency. Oh, really? um, So it was very interesting. You know, because How did that conversation go? It was very, um, oh, really, <laughs> would be my response. Um, because as you go through this process, you never know until you're confirmed what's going to happen. So, you know, in the background, I'm being vetted, and everyone else is telling me who, that they are going to be my boss. Um, so it was really exciting. Um, and again, I just have to really thank and also applaud um, the young people, the administration, because they were innovative. Mm. They did something that was not the way that things were normally done in the federal government. Mm. Uh, and that they took a chance and that they made it happen. Um, and they supported. So, um, you know, I'm grateful to those young people, um, one of whom I then brought in as my chief of staff um, as well, who was phenomenal. And then I had this opportunity to lead a phenomenal agency that did international economic development around the world, um, applying some of the things that I had learned and techniques I had used. And the other, I think, really thread that went through is the agency is one that does planning hmm. for projects. Uh, so what it's doing is always looking forward. What's the new technology that's going to be used? Is it going to work in developing in middle-income countries? So it's this continuum innovation. And my agency became known for being innovative. I had a lot of young people around me who were absolutely amazing, um, willing to come up with new ideas, to take risks, to take chances. And then uh, January 20 was rolling around. Mm. And on January 20, everyone should leave the US government um, who is a presidential appointee, including the president. Mm. And so people would say, you know, what's next? What are you mm. going to do? Mm. And I could have gone back um, as a career as a senior executive, but you know, I love the opportunity to um, to lead and to and run things. And I sincerely thought about what did I want to do. And I said, you know, I really want to give back. Now it's time mm. for me to give back. And to what? And I decided to what made me who I am. And that mm. was my education. And so I wanted to give back um, in higher education. 
I realized that today, especially with liberal arts colleges, they were facing many challenges, mm. some of which really included the need to focus on finances and operation to support their mission in the future. Mm. And I realized those were skills that I had, mm. um, as well as a true love for higher education. I was an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown Law School mm. for a number of years and loved being in the classroom and the students. But I really thought I wanted to give back to what made me who I am. And uh, as a result, I sought a presidency. Wow, and so then what brought you to Agnes Scott? It is the best college in the entire country. So that's where I wanted to be. Um, and it truly is a place that called to me. And I felt that we really um, had shared values. Agnes Scott is one, it's innovative. I'm happy to talk more about mm -hmm. that. I will say, I can't help but say, Agnes Scott was ranked number one for innovation by US News and World Report for all liberal arts colleges throughout the country and for an unprecedented six times. Wow. This is its sixth year, it's never been done before. So one, it's a place that we have a shared value of innovation. I really respect its values. But through that innovation, one of the things that the college did is it developed a unique experience called Summit. Mm. So in its, throughout its liberal arts, it's incorporated a focus on global learning and women's leadership development. Mm. That just called to me. That had been my career. That had been my life, focusing on global learning and trying to inspire into new women leaders as well. So as soon as I heard about it, um, about the opening, and especially being a woman's college, it was something that called to me. And it, they demonstrated their innovation because of the fact that they brought me in as the president. It is highly unusual. It's becoming less so, but highly unusual in higher education, especially in liberal arts colleges, to bring in a president that hasn't been a vice president for academic affairs or a provost, um, mm -hmm. someone who comes from, who's had the teaching experience, but not has not come through the academy right. as well. Right. So um, you had some such interesting experiences in some challenging environments in terms of creating alignment, shared governance, and even in government settings where you've got to create a lot of um, uniformity and kind of a shared vision with people that may have different points of view. So what have been some of your leadership lessons along the way or learnings along the way? How do we bring people along when maybe they are resistant or, or you've got a, lots of folks you've got to bring along? And I love the fact that you saw the thread um, between them. I, one of the things in doing international economic development work is the fact that you're dealing with people of different cultures, yeah. different constituents, maybe government, maybe local constituents. So one of the things you have to do is to find out what is it that they need? Mm -hmm. How is it that what you are trying to do is responsive to their needs? So you have to start out by one, understanding the culture, and two, ensuring that you're listening to what the different needs are of the different people, mm. and then trying to find alignment among those. And that is no different um, than one, what one does in a higher education environment. Higher education is slightly different than many other places because they do have this concept of shared governance. Mm. And it is, um, you know, it's something that is really cherished in higher education. It came out of the desire for freedom of speech and ensure that there was protection with respect to the faculty for their research and their thought. So in higher education, faculty has a real responsibility with respect to what it is that's being taught. The trustees have a responsibility with respect to the fiduciary, they have a fiduciary duty. And is it is it going to be an ongoing institution? The administration has a responsibility for the operations. So it's a, and each one of them 
advises with respect to some of the roles of the other. So it depends on the culture of your institution, but there are a lot of constituents. Um, you also have alums and others and students as part of that. Um, but people have important roles, and they want to be ensure they want to ensure that they're respected. Um, and they're mm. heard in those roles. And so then it's how do you bring all of those people together? Yeah. So it's interesting the way you describe it because you have the faculty really responsible for the teaching and the learning. Then you've got the trustees with the fiduciary responsibility. And then you've got the operational responsibility. And everyone has a, has a say to a certain degree on, with everyone else. So everyone else is in each other's kitchen g- <laughs> giving <laughs> opinions on how you're cooking that meal. Absolutely. Which, which can be helpful, can also be challenging at times. So, so how do you create um, alignment in that system so it does turn out to be a kind of a beautiful, you know, synchronized system versus one with a lot of tension and conflict, which is which can be common. What are some of the tricks as a leader to make that work? Well, I would say it's something I'm still working on, um, and I think every president is always working on. But I really do believe that one of the most important parts is focusing on mission. That is the common thread, mission and students. That's what we're there for. That's what we have to remind ourselves of. That's what speaks to each one of those constituencies, Um, each one of those groups, is are we doing the right thing for our students? Are we being true to our mission? So ensuring when we're making decisions, and for us, you know, in our mission and what we're doing is really focusing on inclusive academic excellence. It helps to bring people together. The other thing, and I, you know, COVID interrupted this a little bit. Um, I arrived, you know, before COVID. You know, we there was a, you know, shutdown. People went home after COVID. Period of time where people didn't engage as much after COVID. So I feel like we are having a renewal and a rebirth um, post COVID, and a time for us all to get to know each other again. So building relationships, um, individual relationships, relationships amongst those groups, is something that I think is incredibly important um, as you are working together toward common goals. I mean, one of the things I did, um, you know, since um, COVID in the past, you know, the past six months, I would say, the end of last semester and this semester, is to gather faculty members around the dining room table in my home. Hmm. And the goal is not to talk about the college or to have, you know, a special topic. The topic is, who are you? Where did you Hmm. grow up? What brought you here? And what we learned is, you know, sometimes people didn't know people that they have been in community with for 30 years. They're now learning where they grew up or what they have in common. But it really brought forward an understanding of one another and where we were coming from, which I think really helps in the decision-making process. So you could have chosen to do that at a restaurant or on campus, but you chose your home. Why? Because it's my home. I think there's very there's something very special about gathering people in your home. It's disarming. It's where you live. Um, it gives people an opportunity to know who you are. It's a little different, I will say, in a president's house um, because it is a president's house. But we still have tried to make it our home. And it's to provide that comfort and that warmth um, in that environment. And I have to say, you know, I grew up in a household where, and I know it's hard to do today, but I grew up in a household where we gathered around the dining room table. Um, you know, we tried to at dinner time almost every week, but definitely once a week um, for Sundays. And we had amazing conversations at the table. And that's what I wanted to replicate. I wanted to replicate, again, something in my experience that I felt brought people closer together. So I want to spend a little more time on the mastery, and I know this is my words, the mastery that you've done with bringing everyone together and really focusing on that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation. I think so often when leaders think about executives, they often think, oh, she or he is sitting in their ivory tower thinking about strategy all day long. When you think about how you use your time, how would you, when you think about a given week, how much time is spent on building relationships versus thinking about longer-term vision versus other, other activities? 
Well, anyone who is um, part of my senior executive team and leadership team will know that I think about strategy while I'm blow drying my hair. <laughs> um, because they get those emails and texts in the morning. I was just thinking. Um, so I would say that's where a lot of that is happening, um, is as I'm walking around campus, as I'm doing things, chatting with people. Um, I do think that the relationship building is such an important part and such a big part of the job. And I have to say, it's something that I learned. Um, I recognized it in doing the diplomatic work that I did. But I will say, I think one of the biggest surprises for me was the fact that, especially in higher education, people want to know who you are. Mm. And I have to tell you, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer by training. I build by the hour. I have to confess, build by the minute. And when you're <laughs> doing that, nobody wants to know who you are. Um, right. You know, they want to know what you can do for them, um, but they really are not interested in spending their money to find out who you are. This is totally different. Hmm. And I had to stop and think about it. And one of the things that I've learned is, you know, I remind myself, take a minute. When you're walking by someone and you say hello, stop. Yeah. Don't just walk by. Take a minute um, to develop that relationship as student, faculty member, someone else. And that's something that people will remember, but it's something I learn every day from people when I take that minute. It's so funny. Hearing you talk, it reminds me, um, some years ago, I was doing work with a manufacturing organization, and I asked the folks out on the plant floor, I said, well, you know, would you rather have like a $15, $20 gift card, or would you rather have your general manager come around one morning and give you a, a, a biscuit? They said, I'd rather have the biscuit. I'd rather have that general manager come over, just take a minute, see me, hand me a biscuit, uh, versus the $20 gift card. And these are folks that aren't necessarily making high wages, but they'd rather have that connection. It means a lot more to them. And I think that can be very hard for leaders because it's a balance. You know, they're trying not to, you know, talk about themselves too much. They want to engage in others. So I think it can be, it's a very difficult balance. And sometimes I really do think it's something that has to be learned, that people want that time. Yeah. Because you kind of think, oh, wait a minute, who wants to talk to me? You know, but the reality is that people do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, acknowledging that and taking the time for it. So I love, Lee, what you just gave us was kind of a master class as an executive on how to think about building relationships with all your constituents. Now, innovation's been a part of the secret ingredient in Agnes Scott. And I know that innovation was alive and well before you got there, but you've really yeah. kept that going since your tenure there. Uh, so while we want to honor that innovation was there, it almost feels like relationship building is a critical first step if we want to then have innovation. So what are some of the key things that you think are critical for leaders to think about if they want to infuse innovation into the culture or create innovation in an existing system? Well, I, one of the things is I do think it is recognizing that innovation never stops. So oftentimes people get very excited, you know, in what they created and they innovated and were number one, but the reality is you can never stop. And there is a concern, especially as people in higher education, you know, they're preparing for their classes, they're educating their students. There can be what people refer to as innovation fatigue. Like, do I have to do something again or something different? Um, and the reality is yes. Um, <laughs> that to be able to stay relevant, but I would say to stay relevant for your students. Um, focus on the mission. Mm. What is it, our students today, what do they need to know because they're gonna be our leaders of tomorrow? That we can't stop. Looking at the past is important. Being in the present, absolutely vital. But we always have to be looking to the future because these students are our future. And so that has to be what we instill in them and we can never stop. And one of the things I used to tell people at my agency and you know, I uh, mentioned at the college, and forgive me, uh, Blackberry, for saying this because I loved you so much <laughs> um, and I hated giving you up, but you don't want to be Blackberry. No. You that's, don't, a great, that's a great example. You don't want to be the folks who come out with the best device that everybody loves. And then this other company comes out with a device that does the same thing, but every year they come out with a new feature. 
and they yeah. advertise it yeah. and they talk about it and people start to wait for it and they start to buy it and they keep innovating and then you die and they succeed. So you can never stop innovating and you never, if you look at the mission in higher education, you never should stop innovating because of the fact of who it is that we serve and what it is that we're gonna need for the future. Yeah, that, I love that. I love that example of BlackBerry and the importance of keeping it going. I also love it. It's very subtle that you, you said it in there, but I want to call it out to everyone listening. You elevate innovation and connect it to mission. You say, we have to do it in service of our students. And so everyone listening here today, what is their mission? What, why would innovation be important? What, 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 what to link it to? So any other, as you think about your journey from kind of the agency world, some of your diplomatic experiences, even uh, law firm world, and then now higher education. Any other big leadership learnings along the way? What are, what are some of the either differences or, or common threads through those, through those different, different chapters you've had? Well, I think one of the most important things um, is also building the right team oh, nice. as a leader. And for, you know, for me and Agnes Scott in particular, diversity and inclusion are vital. Um, people may not realize that Agnes Scott, which was traditionally you know, a white woman's college, today has no majority on its campus. Oh, really? No ethnic, racial, or socioeconomic majority. Interesting. We value diversity and inclusion. And it's something that I very much value with respect to my leadership team and also the diversity of thought. And I am one of the people who believes, especially in higher education, oftentimes it can be very president-centric. There is a bit of hierarchy. I love having a phenomenal team and the phenomenal team that I have and empowering them ensuring that they have the authority to do what they need to do, that they have my trust, ensuring they have my support, and the fact that we have diversity of thought. And I was able to do that at my agency. And again, of course, that was very important because we were global. And also we have that at Agnes Scott today in a leadership team. And I think that's a thread, but it's also, if I would advise any leader, having diversity and having a goal toward inclusion is always gonna make you better. Diversity of thought always comes back with better ideas. Okay, so as we're uh, rounding out our conversation here today, I'm gonna pull out my magic crystal ball. Okay, we'll stick it here in the middle. Uh, and as you look into the future, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges? Or maybe there's one big challenge, I don't, whatever you see in the crystal ball, when you think about higher education. What's, what are some of the challenges that leaders need to be thinking about today? I'm not even sure it's a crystal ball um, because those challenges are here today. <laughs> okay. Um, and one of the things that I think we all have to focus on is the challenge with respect to mental health for students today. Young people today come to colleges, but it starts way before that, with a great deal of anxiety mm -hmm. that they have grown up in a world that's post 9-11. For them, climate change and the concern about the climate is real. Are they gonna have a future? They just went through COVID and a pandemic and they had to relearn how to socialize. So mental health is something that is something of today and something that we have to all get better at. Hmm. Um, Agnes Scott actually started a master's program in counseling and we've learned a lot as a result of that. Hmm. The other thing, um, as you will see in higher education, that we're all battling is what is the cost um, hmm. to educate students today? Hmm. That you know, salaries, um, facilities, technology, all costs are going up, inflation, and how do we keep those costs reasonable for students? I think a big part of that is philanthropy and the need for people to value education. And I think that would be the last piece, is that there's been a little bit of erosion in the value of higher education. Hmm. And that's something that I think we all have to 
pay special attention to and recognize the value of higher education. And that's going to be with us and something we have to continue to work on in the future. Yeah, this Lee, fantastic. I really love this conversation. So when, as leaders are listening here today, what's a practical tip you might have for them? Something they could take back, regardless of what role they might be playing in their organization, to help them become a better leader starting tomorrow. Do you have any pieces of advice or tips? I would advise people to always put yourself in someone else's shoes and also to be sure to have the courage to act. Hmm. Thank you. Lee, this has been an absolute joy. So if people want to learn more about Agnes Scott, where, where can they go? Or learn more about the good work you're doing? Well, thank you so much. First of all, I have to tell you, I've had a terrific time. Thank you so much My absolute pleasure. for this conversation. And people can find us at our website, um, which is www.agnescott.edu. Okay. Great. Well, I encourage everyone to check out uh, all the great work, all the innovative work that you're doing and the, the amazing things that are coming out of that. Uh, I think it's a role model for all of us and inspiration for all of us. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I think President Zach gave us a masterclass on two really critical things for all leaders today. First, relationship building. Second, innovation. So she reminds us for relationship building, people want to feel heard, respected, and she makes it a point to find time to connect, whether she's having people over to her house and having dinners to walking around campus. She makes that a critical effort and a process, and it helps her in that environment where there is so much shared governance to really bring people together. And she reminds everyone about the vision as a central unifier to get everyone focusing on that same North Star. Speaking of that North Star, that's also the way that we take innovation and we make it part of the culture. We remind folks that we're innovating on behalf of something bigger and greater, not just because we've been asked to do it, not just because our shareholders ask us to, to be innovative, but because it's for the future and it's to serve our mission. So she gave us some really great tools and tactics on how we can make innovation and relationship building critical to us as we are leaders, regardless of the organization we're in. I'm sure you have some other nuggets you took away from our conversation. Most important point, what's the one thing you want to take away that you can start doing tomorrow to make you and your organization better today?